You're listening to the Elephant in the Room Property Podcast, where the big things that never get talked about actually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, and co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia. And I'm Chris Bates, financial planner, mortgage broker, and wealth coach. And together, we're going to uncover who's really making the decisions when you buy a property. Veronica will introduce our guest in a moment, and I can tell you that you want to listen on to find out what he has to say about all the tricks and traps of depreciation. I mean, I have to admit, I actually learned a few things in this episode that, you know, these little things that investors can make, these small decisions that could cost them a hell of a lot of money. If you buy a brand new property today and you rent it out for a year and then you move in, you'll kill your deductions from that point that you go in on those plant and equipment items because the next time you rent it, those assets are sort of previously used. Please stick around for this week's Elephant Rider Bootcamp. And we have a cracking Dumbo of the Week coming up. Before we get started, everything we talk about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent. They will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances. Now let's get cracking. In this episode, we pick the brains of Mike Mortlock. Mike is the Managing Director of MCG Quantity Surveyors, which was recently recognised as Australia's fastest growing quantity surveying firm by the Australian Financial Review Fast 100, no less. He's completed thousands of residential and commercial schedules from units to houses to trout farms. MCG were the first quantity surveying firm to publish real data on the average deductions for property investors, and he's also the host of Geared for Growth Property Investing Podcast. He's interviewed both Chris and I, but not sure whether those interviews will be available to listen to before this one goes to air, but, you know, we're friends, aren't we? Yeah, stay tuned. (laughs) Now, when we asked Mike about the lasting message he'd like to leave you listeners, he said that he'd like people to be very sceptical of the media, spookers, and to take your time on the due diligence stuff and build a property team, which is very boring, of course, since it means that we're all in agreement. (laughs) So to spice up our chat, Mike has brought along some very interesting statistics. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Mike. Good to see you. Yeah, you too as well. And uh, enjoyed being on your podcast, which was um, which was great. So you've done some research and you reckon about 38% of property buyers buy new property? Yep. Um, investors. Investors, yeah. Investors, sorry, yeah, yeah, investors. I mean, you said that people need to be sceptical of spruikers. You know, yeah. Do you have any horror stories that we could kick off our program with? I think I've come to the right show for being sceptical of spruikers. But, um, <laughs> yeah, look, we, we don't sort of analyse properties too much after we've done our work, but it'd be really interesting to go and see people that are, are purchasing for X amount for units off the plan and what those valuations are later on in time. We're certainly seeing that units off the plan in a number of capital cities are not really great candidates for capital growth, and at the moment people are probably sitting on negative equity. But I, I I think it just sort of comes down to we getting it us about. We don't have the plan. We sort of think about the property and the hotspot for first, not necessarily what we're trying to get to, whether it's a retirement income or something like mm. that. But certainly I've seen people, you know, purchasing apartments in uh, developments and then uh, six, 12 months later, someone's got something very similar for a hundred grand less. Mm. And, and that really worries me. Yeah. And what do you think that's, why is that happening? Do you think what's, what's, what's happened there? Do you think? Well, like people blame, people bl- blame the, the glossy brochures. It's always gloss, isn't it? Right. I wonder as a coating, gloss gets the most sort of criticism, but mm. I, I think it's just this, this sharp marketing stuff that goes into the development stuff, all of the lifestyle, you know, you see the children sort of running down the lane in the housing mm. estates and all that sort of stuff. You know, psychologists used to sort of help people. Now they help sell things, right? Mm. Uh, I think that's a bit of a concern thing and, and I think that it just plays on the emotions and, and people they're, they're not as objective as they ought to be in looking at an investment property it's it's kind of like they'll look at it and they go oh yeah I would live there so it's probably a good investment mm. some of the best investments are places that might make your skin crawl or they're just not suited to your family or the way yeah. that you want to live what's it quite an interesting point really it's probably not gloss anymore though is it? it's really like more of a matte paper <laughs> yeah, yeah matte like GSM or sort of, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, um, heavy stock <laughs> yeah but I mean, it's true though. Like we, you know, we want to have live in a nice place. We want to have a, you know, tell our friends that we live in this nice new building and we've bought this nice new and it's got this kind of whole lifestyle. Yeah. You rock up and say, I've just bought this two bedroom brick 
uh, boring, red you know, brick. red brick <laughs> apartment, yeah. you know, that's in a block of six and it's got, you know, like old features and you need yeah. to put a new kitchen and a bathroom. It hasn't got that kind of wow factor when yeah. you're telling people, does it? Yeah, or I've built, you know, I've bought a strata titled warehouse in Campsie or something like that. That might be the best investment you could make at that particular mm. time. That's a hypothetical, of course. I haven't done my due diligence on warehouses there's or not, Campsie. There's not many warehouses in Campsie no. yeah, there you that, go. Are, that are residential. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, I mean, it's interesting, though, that... Um, Talk about some investments might make your skin crawl. <laughs> and did you have something in mind when you said that? Oh, <laughs> I've, I've seen a lot of nasty stuff in property inspections that I've done. I mean, the amount of times I've seen a, a doona animate itself from out of nowhere in a property that was supposedly vacant um, from the property manager giving us the keys. You know, I've seen, I've seen drugs, drugs paraphernalia, lots of handcuffs, some of them fluffy. Mm. But, yeah, certainly places that actually on paper would be, would be good investments yeah. and they just kind of, there's too much grunge. You know, like I wouldn't say that I, I, I live, uh, you know, as a one percenter or any, any sort of posh domicile myself, but there are some places where I kind of think, uh I've got to get out of here. What do you think's happened there? How's the investor, have they bought that un- site unseen? Like if they've gone interstate and bought something online or? Yeah, I think that, that, that is a lot more prevalent these days. And I, and I know that uh, even some, some buyers agents will do that on behalf of clients and not physically sort of see it themselves. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it's a little bit more prevalent. And I, and I think that sometimes if you're, if you're looking for particularly cash flow properties, which mm. might be a little bit cheaper, it attracts the sort of person that might appreciate the property at a faster rate than somebody else. So you can I get something that looks... in there. Yeah, there we go. There's the, a little... The, attract somebody who might depreciate the property at a faster rate than somebody else. So what you're basically saying is a crap tenant. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I, I, could probably, <laughs> I could probably do politics, right? I'd make it you sort of sound so palatable. You are beautifully, beautifully <laughs> phrased, yeah. <laughs> but it's true, right? Like, and it's quite a big point for investors to, mm. to think about is, you know, when you are buying properties that are in outer suburbs or in rural locations or where there's lots of, you know, it, let's say social there's social problems. problems yeah. Mm. And let's say the incomes aren't there and the, you know, lots of renters, um, yeah. you know, unfortunately you start to get problems with tenants yeah. and, you know, when you, the end of the day, it's an asset that you want to keep the value and make sure that you continue to rent it out. And if you do get problems with a tenant, getting a tenant out isn't easy, right? And yeah. then especially if they damage the property, you've got to go and fix it and get another tenant. And so, got to be really careful who you rent your property to, I guess. Yeah. But you're a, uh, sorry, you're a quantity surveyor, so you talk about depreciation because obviously that's something you talk about all the time. Can you get better deductions if your tenants depreciate the property faster than somebody else might? No, not not really. I mean, back in the day, you used to be able to sort of scrap assets that basically are sort of worn out and they might have a residual value and you can get some instant deductions based on that. But the tax commissioner has statutory rates of depreciation, really. So carpet has an effective life of 10 years and depending on your method, that'll give you your depreciation rate. So often people sort of think we're going in like tenants, you know, we're taking photos and notes and measurements or and we're looking at, oh, you know, that carpet, you've worn that out a bit heavier, so it's depreciating faster. Now it's all a flat statutory thing. But I want to make the point that tenants aren't necessarily the only problem here. And I, you know, I certainly don't want to say that, that people in a, a low socioeconomic bracket are all going to degrade a property faster. Landlords can be the problem, problem as well. And, and we're often sort of used as a bargaining chip. Like we might have a tenant say, I'm not going to let you in to do an inspection for the landlord. And we, we, you know, we go back and forth and we try and be flexible and do it after hours and all that sort of stuff and explain what we're doing. And then we find out that it's because the landlord wouldn't fix a tap, mm. right? So so they're like, he's not getting that or she's not getting that, you know, us coming in until that is sort of looked after. So I think you can be really, really mean. And if you are buying the cheaper properties and it's all about cash flow, you can take it too far. And as you say, Chris, the cost of getting someone out or, or the cost of repairing the damage that they can do in an afternoon is astronomical mm. compared to a tap or a fly yeah. screen or silly stuff like that. It's actually interesting. A lot of property managers I know have actually sacked their landlords yeah. who refuse to actually really look after their investment. Yeah. 
And and I think that that is a really good point that you bring up for our listeners to understand too, that as a landlord, you are, you know, we're always, our message is obviously buy quality property and a quality property tends to attract quality tenants, but at the same time, you've got to be a quality landlord. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an asset that you've got to look after. And if you've got good tenants, looking after your property encourages them to report things as they go wrong yeah. as well. And then you can keep on top of things. And it's, it is very important point. It's hard to do though, right? Like if you're starting a business or there's lean times, you don't want to sort of get rid of those people. But in the end, it, it pays off to do so because they're, re- they're going to refer people like themselves, people that they're friends with that maybe have the same attitudes. And it affects your your stats, you know, your vacancy rates and all that sort of stuff because of, of how they're sort of carrying on with the tenants. So yeah, I, I would in, I encourage property managers to do that, um, to have the, the courage to, to say, look, I don't want to represent you because this doesn't stand for what I what I believe in. Now, we've done an entire episode on Labor's negative gearing policy and the Mm. potential impact on the property market. And we don't really want to rehash what we've already spoken about. But can you shed some light on what people are actually claiming back on tax? Yeah, so um, we, as, as you mentioned in the intro, we were the first quantity surveyor to share real world data, mostly because I was annoyed that our industry was sort of saying, on average, people get uh, five to ten thousand dollars worth of deductions back. We we analyze a thousand schedules. Um, we actually did a smaller sample size first, and we found that it was nine thousand one hundred eighty three dollars. In our in our figure of uh, of a thousand properties, we found that figure to be nine thousand four hundred fifteen. So so really, that nine thousand four hundred fifteen. 15 is your average first year deductions under the diminishing value method. I don't want to put people to sleep and talk about no. the different <laughs> methods, but that's the best one in the short term, right? Yeah. And so, hang on. So the deduction means that you deduct that from your taxable income, yeah. which means that really it's costing the government how much? Yeah. So if you're on 100K and you've got 10 grand worth of deductions, the government now only sees you earning $90,000 a year. So so based on our average of $9,415, you're actually going to get $3,484 back in your pocket if you're on, say, 100 or 150K. Um, if you're on 200K and the top marginal uh, rate, you're getting you know 4,200 or thereabouts back in your pocket or around about three grand if you're on 50K. So so it's important to, to understand that the deduction aren't going back in your pocket. You know, it's going to be somewhere around just just shy of half of that. But that's what the the power of depreciation is. And it just, it really helps with your sort of serviceability of that property uh, on an after-tax basis. Yeah, I mean, the... I think that's pretty crazy. A lot of investors sometimes don't even go and get a depreciation schedule, right? They just think, oh, it's an old building. Mm. I don't need to do it. That's no. a big one. That's mm. a big one. Like it's 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 too old to do it because a lot of people uh, they have the idea or they, they've picked up one tiny little snippet of of depreciation facts um, and that's that there's a cut off date for the building structure. It used to be 1985, but now it's September 87. And and for some reason, property investors knew this, whereas they didn't really tend to know anything out else mm. about depreciation. <laughs> so firstly, we had to re-educate them that really the date has shifted because it used to be 25 years at 4%, now it's 2.5% for 40 years. So there's that little window that's kind of disappeared now. But then we needed to say, okay, well, if the original structure was built in the 60s or 70s, that doesn't mean that everything else inside is that age. Like we don't see 60s and 70s kitchens in Sydney because like, (laughs) why would you do that? Why would you not spend, you know, 20 or 30 grand to charge an extra 200 bucks a week in rent? You do see it a little bit in regional areas, but you've just got to think, if I've bought prior to 80, seven what is still original and chances are the kitchen the bathroom maybe extension a driveway a carport these can all still uh, attract depreciation deductions on what is the building structure yeah so i guess for our listeners here even if you are buying an older style apartment let's say or a house you know there could be you know a lot of depreciation there yeah that, you know, just by going through the building and, you know, do you sometimes see huge depreciation in these buildings? Massive. And more than a brand new constructed four bedroom house because people might have bought, you know, a fairly substantial place that was built at the turn of the century and they've sunk 700 grand in renovations into it. Mm. Why they're sort of renting that out, I'm not sure, but maybe their plan is that that'll be their principal place of residence down the track and they're quite happy to, to put that amount of money into it. We found, we found in our analysis of a thousand um, schedules that the average deductions are just shy of 200k. Um, that's for all sort of property types. But if, yeah, if you're putting that amount of money into it, you're gonna you're gonna blow that average out of the water. You might be sitting on thirty thousand dollars a year worth of deductions. So it's pretty significant. 
Well, what about if somebody else has renovated the property? So say you bought, you know, in a 60s building yeah. and the previous owner did the renovations yeah. and then you've bought it. People love that because you get to profit from their blood, sweat and tears. Um, so if the previous owner did some some works to the property, let's say they did an extension, um, we're qualified to estimate the value of that and you can claim that because you've given consideration for that as part of the property purchase, right? You, it might have only cost you 100 grand less if it wasn't renovated, yeah. but you paid extra because you got that asset so you're entitled to, to claim it. So in, with the new changes of the rules last year, mm. or well, it's two years ago, 17, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. How does that affect that though? Does it, you know, do you still get to claim for all the internal sides of that re- renovation? Uh, yes and no. If, if the only way that you can claim the internal stuff, and by that we sort of talk about things like kitchen appliances and carpets and blinds and that sort of stuff, the, the, the only way that you can claim that if you're bur- uh, purchasing from today is you're buying a brand new property yep. or you're actually installing those assets yourself. And there's a few caveats with that. Like if you buy a brand new property today and you rent it out for a year and then you move in, you'll kill your deductions from that point that you go in on those plant and equipment items because the next time you rent it, those assets are sort of previously used. Really? Yeah. Whoa. Oh, there's a little elephant in the room. Mm. I didn't know that. Yeah. So you're saying if you buy, I didn't know that. So if you buy a new apartment yeah. and then as an investment yeah. and then you say, look, oh, I'm moving house in between two houses or something like that. Yeah. I need to just live somewhere. I'll go live in my apartment. Yeah. You're potentially writing off huge amount of depreciation. Yeah, there's there's been some um, there's been some education that we've had as part of our institute that, that basically sort of says that anecdotally, even if you're staying in your um, your property for a weekend to renovate it, you can actually trigger a problem where those assets become previously used, and it's a big wow. problem for holiday homes as well. Yeah. So the the best tax advice, um, and and accountants are always clever at finding ways around it. If you actually get your mum to go and stay at your holiday house, technically you should charge her rent and if you're a nice person buy her a present to the equivalent amount back right but if you're if you or a related entity or something like that is is going into that property then it ceases to become an investment for a short time and you can kill those plant and equipment deductions wow that's really interesting because you know like that's a small little thing it's oh why don't we just go stay at our investment property or we're in between tenants yeah Um, we'll let my mates stay in it or whatever it is, and, you know, there's huge tax consequences there. Yeah, and I love the small little things, right, because I'm sort of a, a depreciation nerd, right? Mm-hmm. You can you can tell by, <laughs> you know, I've, I've, the data that we sort of try and share just shows that there's something slightly wrong with me as, a, as an individual. But <laughs> another thing that we found... <laughs> Another thing that we found is that, you know, when, when the announcement w- was, was made um, in May 2017, they said that, that all previous purchases would be grandfathered. So if you exchanged prior the 9th of May, it's the Wild West old rules. Mm. But there was one little caveat that people didn't pick up on for a while, and that was that the property had to be income producing in that financial year. So if you didn't have it rented out by the 30th of June 2017, you weren't old rules, right? Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So that means if I say I'm living in my home that I bought and to live in, and then yep. I, my plan is to upgrade and go and you know, buy something else and, yep. and keep this property as an investment. Yeah. Even though I owned it before May 2017, I can't claim depreciation on the plant and equipment. The plant and equipment, yeah. You still get the building structure, but because it wasn't available for rent. Wow, that is a a tricky one. And I don't, yeah, two elephants we've got from you so far. So through that whole Mm. year, if you didn't, if you, let's say you were living in it and you claimed it as your home, if it didn't go on the market to rent in that that year, that financial year, it's not seen as an investment property that you own prior. Uh, yeah, you, you you will not be under the old rules that mean that you could claim plant and equipment, move in and out as you please. Obviously, you can't claim it when you're in, but when you move back out, like under the old rules, yeah. you'd then be able to start mm. claiming again. And that's like, it seems really nuanced, but I wanted to sort of dig into the data and find like how many people might have actually got caught out by that. We've certainly seen some. In our analysis where we looked at a thousand residential schedules, we, we, we found that around about 22, 23% uh, the number escapes me exactly. But 22, 23% of people actually occupy their property before it becomes an investment property. And that's way higher than what we thought. Like if if, if, I, if someone asked me, I, I would have said, I don't know, maybe 8 to 10% of people mm. would live in their investment before it becomes an investment property. property. So what we think... But, but do we think that that's partly because of the first home buyer grants and, and 
Yeah. You know, that there's been a big incentive for people to live in it for six to 12 months. And then the whole plan was always as an investment. Yeah. Um, but That's that way really they get their question. grant. That's a really good question. And, and, and we kind of thought, I didn't want that to be true because then it's not as interesting as a stat, right? People are just actually <laughs> being clever mm. and, you know, they're, they're claiming the first time earner grant and that sort of thing. But we actually found out that the average number of days that people lived in the property was somewhere close to 1,400 days, well, right? right. Okay. Yeah. So if you're just doing it for that incentive, that 15. average would have been a lot mm. lower. So certainly there's a, there's a that that is a factor, mm. but it's that it, it's not the majority factor yeah. from our view. Interesting. Yeah, and the other two factors probably would be that you've bought a house or a unit with the intention of when you do move out to buy another house, you're going to keep that as an investment property. Yep. So that would be... Well, a lot of people Fine. don't actually buy with that intention. It's just that they're actually doing better than they expected to be by the yep. time they're ready to upgrade yeah. and they can afford to keep it. And so then they look at it and say, oh, I think I'll keep it. And yeah. But they haven't set it themselves up originally. They haven't set up the right tax structures or the borrowing structures and all that sort of stuff yeah. initially to actually maximise that. So all their equity is in that property. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. so and because I talk to a lot of people in that boat actually yeah. done better than they thought, you yeah. know, that they anticipated. Yeah, and that's very true. You know, there's lots of people who have done, you know, they've bought a house and it's doubled or whatever it's happened and they didn't set their, their loan up the right way and they did what they thought was the right thing to do and that's to pay off your home loan, which is what everyone tells you to do. So mm. they they went principal and interest and then they smashed their loan down and by the time they, you know, want to move out of that house, they've almost paid the house off and there's yeah. so much equity there and then they, yeah. they come to someone like me and then they go, Oh, Chris, you know, we're thinking about moving from, you know, this house to this house and we want to keep our current house. And it very rarely in those scenarios makes sense to keep the house. It yep. generally makes sense to upgrade, sell the house that you're in or the apartment, pay off the new house you've moved into, and then go back into the market yep. and buy another investment. And it's a real big, like, that's, like that's, that's education. That's a really interesting point that you make. You, you know, from an analysis point of view, it's probably better to get rid of that old house. But people are so sort of jazzed up with the idea that, oh, now we've become an accidental investor. And in fact, when we shared this data, that's what the journalists sort of titled the story, you know, the, mm. the rise of the accidental investors. And I think that there's, you know, often there's a sentimental attachment to that property as well. So we don't, we don't always behave perfectly well in a vacuum analytically, we might kind of go, oh, it's a bit easy. Like, we'll just sort of keep that. Then we don't have to worry about, you know, do we, do we try and find the property ourselves or do the research? But, you know, that is one thing that, uh, one mistake that I sort of see property um, investors doing. Um, they might buy a property that's already got a tenant in there and they keep the same property manager because it's easy. Now they might be the best person, mm -hmm. but it's worth interviewing other people or they'll buy something around the corner from where they live. And I kind of, you know, it's hard, you don't want to be sort of rude to people, but in my head, I'm thinking, what are the chances that of all the, the suburbs in Australia, you happen to live in the top prospect for capital growth as an investment mm. as you know <laughs> compared to the you know the rest of the country yeah i mean you're saying mate, that's the elephant right like yeah. you know and that's what you know it's so true i mean if you do think of things rationally and logically and you talk through the upgrade and selling and you know it takes a, a, a while probably takes you know 15 minutes half an hour sometimes to really talk it through but what they don't want to do is they don't really, they think that you should never sell because yeah. there's a belief that you buy and hold and you never sell property. But yeah. if it's your home, you're not paying capital gains tax. And so really the costs are really the selling costs of the agent, stamp duty again. And if you can like kind of get a bigger tax write off by buying it again and then yeah. having lower home debt, you end up having a life that's a lot less stressful, a lot yeah. less home debt and a lot better tax advantages for this one painful experience of selling and then yeah. buying it again. And, I think the big realisation is when you ask the client at the end and say, if you could buy any property in Australia, would you buy the house as an investment? Would you buy this house? Yeah. And then they go, well, probably not. I've obviously bought, want to keep it because I've lived there. Yeah. And then they start to really think through and go, actually, well, yeah, maybe it is the right thing to sell. But, you know, investing where you live, that's just such a huge common one, isn't it? Yeah. I want to be able to see it. I want to be able to drive past it. But does that really matter whether it's, uh, you know? Well, I mean... 
it it shouldn't. It does to people. That's why they keep doing it, right? Mm. But uh, but I think it's a it's it's a crazy thing, uh, and it, and it's an, it's another thing that ties into that psychology of oh, you know, I could see myself living in there, so I can understand that a tenant would w- want to rent it. I mean, my Saturday nights often I'm in bed at nine forty five after an antiques roadshow or something like that. That's not how millennials are living, right? <laughs> so we need to consider that there are people that are different from mm. ourselves. We do. <laughs> and I often say to clients, you know, I know you can't imagine living there, but could you imagine living there when you were a student or when you were in your first job or when you were, you know, between travelling or whatever, you know, like, yeah. I mean, at a different stage in your life, could you imagine living there? Not right now, of yeah. course. Yeah. I think the thing around buying around the corner is also that sort of confirmation bias. You know, it's like, oh, I've made a good decision already. Mm. And so therefore to buy another property in the same suburb is just reinforcing the fact that I already made a good decision. And the fact I've made two decisions in the same suburb means that that's a really good decision to make mm. this sort of loop. Yeah, but then you ask sort of the diversification question and you kind of think, well, is that is that a good decision? You know, if this suburb is going down, I've got all my eggs in that particular basket. I'd much rather be be spread out as, as much as I can. Yeah. And I, look, I think that Chris was saying it before about you might ask somebody after they've owned a property, it's like, would you buy it again? You know, I think most people actually don't know enough about property to even answer that properly. You know, they, they would say, no, I spoke to a guy yesterday. He said to me, oh, you would never want to hear this. Oh, I never want to buy another investment property. I said, why? What happened? You know, what was your story? And he said, well, you know, I did. I had two. They were in regional areas. I had terrible tenants. They were so far away. There was no capital growth. And and it was just a terrible experience. Yeah. Mm. And I'm like, well, of course – someone like that would say, no, I'd never buy that again. But then, Mm. you know, somebody who actually hasn't had that experience, but actually fundamentally doesn't own a good investment property, they just don't know it's not a good investment property because it hasn't hurt them by having a bad tenant or a bad experience like that, or they haven't actually gone to sell and therefore found out they've lost money, then they feel quite good about the fact that they own an investment property. Yeah, and they might not have, you know, studied economics at university and considered the time value of money and things like that. But, I mean, the the stats are are telling us that the average investor buys one investment property and it's tied up in those things. They have an awful experience or they buy in the wrong area and they don't see that growth, so they're just sort of stuck with that. Mm. I mean, that's a really unusual stat for a a property-loving nation and, and a nation that understands that our retirement uh, nest egg is is not really going to be enough with pensions and that sort of stuff. People aren't getting it right, and uh, I really hope that you know through education and podcasts like this, mm. that's something that we can do. Right? We can't save babies. Right? I'm not clever enough to be a surgeon or something like that. But if we can encourage people to to get the right team around them and, and make educated decisions on their investments, then hopefully it sort of changes their life. They can retire early. They can spend more time with their children. They can, you know, not be under stress their entire life. You know, that that's meaningful for me, and and, and that's why I like, uh, you know, participating in conversations like this. Well, it's definitely meaningful for me as well, and I'm pretty certain it's meaningful for Chris. So you said that you know the the majority of investors only buy one. Have you mm. have you got a number on that? Yeah, so like it's seventy three percent at mm. last count, um, and I think that there's only around about two hundred thousand people that own six or more. I think yeah. it's, that's around about close, you know. And and six or more, we could probably argue that that's about the point where you really sort of have achieved some success that could really fund your retirement. I mean, like if you've got. Um, 10 investment properties and they're half a million dollars each and you get them down to the point where you can sell five and then you've you've got them outright, then you're probably living on 100 grand a year. And for a lot of people, that sounds fantastic. For plenty of people, certainly in, in, in Sydney and, and Melbourne working in, you know, degree qualified jobs, they're kind of thinking, yeah, I might have to cut some corners there or the Maserati's not looking really good. Mm. But I mean, it's interesting, these stats, because you know, when we're in these bubbles, we start to assume that everyone's like us or everyone's earning the same amount of money or everyone's yeah. got the same amount of wealth. And, you know, you can very quickly, you know, not understand actually what's happening. And when you do look at the stats, you know, I think it's like 85% of taxpayers don't own a property, yeah. you know, and 15% do own one. Yeah. And then you're saying now 75% of those own just one property, yeah. you know? And so you start to think, well, how many people have actually big property investors and how many, what percentage? And it's, it's pretty scary that um, it's not actually as much as you think. Yeah. Um, and I, I agree that, you know, why don't some, if you had one property and it did well and you did have negative gearing and you had servicing, wouldn't you go and buy another one? Mm. And it shows that, you know, seven out of 10 don't ever get the second one. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of them do just keep one property because it's not working or, 
And, you know, and then once you get bitten once, you know, do you go back in and buy another? No. And yeah. so I think it's a big problem, you know. People, people don't want to sell it. So they might have a, a bad experience, but they don't want to sell the, the property because there's a really big psychological, psychological factor of loss aversion. People mm. don't want to lock in that loss. It might have done nothing or it might be ticking along and it's not costing them any money, but it's not really growing. So they're like, I don't want to get rid of it in case it booms and that sort of thing. Uh, but really, you're absolutely right. If if you're onto a good thing, you rinse and repeat, you do it again, right? Mm. If someone sort of says, this restaurant's fantastic, you go there and you're like, yes, it is. You don't not go back, right? Mm. So people aren't going back, and I think the reason is because they're not they're not purchasing the right property. Um, you know, most of our investors are, are probably in the sort of twenty five to forty five age bracket. Like that's just a just a weird stat. I guess we sort of attract people with our marketing that are sort of agree with with what we're about. Um, I'm pushing up slowly towards the top end of that that bracket. Um, but, you know, people are, are buying at that age. So there's plenty of time to see a couple of cycles, right? And for the right property, they should be sitting on enough equity to get three or four or five. Yeah. The key is there, though, is that they actually realize it's not a very good property. They go through the pain, sell it, know, take that loss, let's say, yeah. and then go back and then go through the process again and re-educate themselves. It's a lot of like thinking, a lot of time in their life to, to go through that stressful experience. But, you know, they just haven't really got the, you know, the, the willpower, I guess, to do that. Uh, yeah, but uh, maybe it's not just the willpower. I mean, there's a lot of conflicting and confusing information out there. I and mean, it's one of the reasons why, you know, this podcast exists, for instance, mm. be, is because we want to make sure that people understand there is good information. There are good things to make decisions on and there are bad things to make decisions on and bad information out there. So all that wishful thinking, um, you know, we did an episode on wishful thinking actually. Huh. It was episode with Lorna Patton. Or 48. 30, no, 40, yeah, 48 I think. Look it up. Guys. Maybe 47 actually. I think it was 47. But, you know, it's why do we do this? Why do we fall for sales pitches? Why do we fall for spru the things that spruikers say? Why do we fall for the glossy brochures from developers? And it's this idea of we want it to be easy. Mm. But the thing is it's actually not easy and it's a bit boring. Like you said, you know, you've basically got to invest, buy a good asset and trust in the fact you bought a good asset and let it do its thing over time. Yeah. Because, you know, you ride those cycles and then in 20 years' time, you know, life is incredibly different if you've actually bought a good asset and just let it do its thing. But the problem is people aren't buying good assets most of the time. Yeah. And it, I would hazard, and I haven't actually put any hard numbers around this, but I really honestly think only 5 to 10% of available property at any given time is actually any good for investors. Yeah. I really think that. We'll call that investment, yeah, investment, investment grade, grade stock mm. or, yeah, something yeah. like that. I, I think you're right. People focus on the wrong things and it's a quagmire. I, I, I don't sort of want to whack the average investor. It, it's really, really difficult. Hard. And you and, and, and I'm specialized in in one thing, but there's a whole, you know, there's a whole wagon wheel of other spokes yes. that I don't understand very well. Um, and, and I've learned enough to sort of spot some of the garbage in, in the media, but that's because, you know, writing and reading, mm. you know, for the last 15 years or something like that. And, in, and when it comes to focusing on the wrong things, I mean, I'm a depreciation guy, right? And people ring me up and they sort of say, I want an investment. I'm paying too much tax. What's the best for depreciation. And in my view, it's the worst investment, right? Mm. It's it's a it's a unit in a block of 400 with a gym and a pool and a basement yeah. car park and a concierge and all that sort of stuff. Now, I haven't heard a lot of people making a killing out of these high-rise development things, but from a <laughs> from, from a depreciation point of view, they're gold, yeah. right? Because you own a percentage of the lift and, you know, a lift can cost a million dollars and I've seen buildings with six of them, right? Mm. And you think about that, well, I might own, you know, half a percent of that. So, you know, I've got, you know, $40,000 worth of lift that I actually mm. own. But then you think you've got to service the bloody thing, right? And then if something is coming up for rent in your building... There might be 80 other currently for rent and the same is true for sales. So you've got, you've got this little local massive supply problem that you're going to have forever. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly right. And, you know, we, we often hear, I often hear people say, oh, but you know, after they're all sold and settled and everything, then, then the dust settles and it's all good. And I'm like, actually, no, it's not ever good because if you've got a building where there's a lot and it's all the same, then yeah, you, you hit them double whammy, your yield is compressed and your capital growth is compressed. I don't get why you'd even invest in a building where you're not getting good yield and you're not getting good capital growth. It's just nuts. Yeah. And you're taking enormous risks. Yeah. 
While we're there, so on new buildings, obviously Opal's <laughs> come out over um, the last month mm. and, you know, papers are loving it because, you know, obviously the Australian public are reading it and clicking it, right? Yeah. So, you know, there's a huge demand from the public to read about the Opal building. Yeah. And I think it's scaring a lot of people because it's like, well, what does this really mean? Is yeah. my, has my building's got problems? And, yeah, yeah. You know, I guess, so what's your view on the whole Opal story and, you know, how, because you see buildings, you've seen more yeah. buildings than most people. Yeah. Um, what's your, what's your view? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we're involved on, in the, in the pre-construction side of things. So we work for, for, for banks doing progress claims for developments and that sort of stuff. I think the, the, the government, uh, in, in all its forms, you know, from, from local councils all the way to, to federal, makes a lot of money off property transactions, right? We're talking maybe a quarter of New South Wales revenue, I think, is from, from property. Um, I have to go back and, and research these stats. We'll have a little asterisk at the bottom. Actually, it was off by 6%, but it's significant, right? That's, <laughs> what, I, that's what I'm getting yeah. at. So, so I mean, the, the lo- local, local councils are getting these, you know, d- development applications with, with heavy fees. They're wanting to sort of push them through. Um, you know, they've created this 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 niche for private certifiers to come in and make sure that we're accelerating that and we're getting, you know, a good speed with that. And I mean, you've got to look at incentives. I think incentives are often uh, the driver yeah. for, for, for various decisions, right? And these private certifiers are incentivized by the work and a developer wants a private certifier that's not going to give them too many problems, right? Like a real estate agent trying to sell a property is going to have their little fold out brochure with pest and building business cards. You can't tell me that they're going to be wanting to give the the most thorough pest and building guys, right? They'll get a reputation as that's the guy that makes sales fall over, right? And I, and, and, and there's been no independence there, right? So the yeah. builder can pick its own certifier. Is yeah. That, that's true. Yeah. yeah so yeah. like it's, I'm going to pick my own auditor. So you, you need to check that I'm doing the right thing. And it's, you know, if you're a developer with quite a bit of, you know, power, mm. you've got a lot of work yeah. and you're a certifier and you want work, yeah. you know, unfortunately you're going to give them what they want. Yeah. And then, and private certifiers, I think have become the scapegoat in this. I, I think we, we need to, to, to wait for the, the whole story to transpire to see if there was any issue there. Yeah. I, I, I can see off the bat, there is a, there is an incentive issue with private certifiers. Yeah. I think, and it, it's an, an endemic problem in the system as well. So I agree that we've got to be very careful about scapegoating anyone. But I did hear a story recently about a plumber who became a private certifier. Right. (laughs) And it's like, that's good, but is he actually certifying anything more than the actual plumbing works? And apparently, yes. Now, I don't know. As I said, this is only anecdotal, Mm. but I think when you've got all this acceleration of, of development and yeah. construction. And like you say, the private certifier system has been designed to accelerate it. Yeah. So therefore you're going to have a whole whole new industry formed yeah. to service this newly um, minted idea of accelerating development. And obviously our state government in New South Wales has, has, has changed the density rules around, you know, main row, arterial roads and train, train lines and stuff like that. So you've got this sort of rezoning um, that's ex- encouraging it as well. You know, you're going to have a demand for qualified people and that's going to put pressure on that side of the industry to actually staff it, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, you can just see where all this happens, can't you? Yeah, you, I mean, you look at what happened with ceiling insulation. I mean, you know, people died, right? Mm. It, it, it became mm. a gold rush. And it was sort of like, you know, back when Perth was booming, people would leave their, you know, jobs in finance to go and drive a truck for 200 grand yeah. a year, right? Mm. You know, that, that uh, I'm not sure if, if, if there's, you know, some perfect parallels between private investing, but I think, you know, getting a, a development application through council has always been very arduous. Occasionally you hear... Uh, of a certain development that has an arrangement with a council where they guarantee, you know, seven day turnaround on DAs. I don't know what sort of meetings happen behind the scenes yeah. to, to make that happen, but but it's a it's a pain point, right? So people always look for the path of least resistance and private certifiers. I, I'm not sure. I think maybe they should be appointed mm. um, by the the local authority rather I than someone. I think there someone is some legislation get. coming out that's going to make sure they're independent. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's good. But I mean, that's one part of the process, right? And I think. Yeah, the council does want to approve it because they make money on the development, but also they make money well on all the rates yes. um, and other things once that building's built. So, you know, it's it's easy for the council to say, well, if we build another 10,000 apartments, that's 10,000 more rates and this is good for our business. And mm. But where after that, what other things do you think have happened, not just in this building, but are happening that are causing these problems? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I don't know too much about the specifics of the case and 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 what the actual construction issues were. But I think that the when you when you think about it, it's it's like these these ships that come into dock and you know hear anecdotes of them park there. It's like ten thousand dollars an hour, right? So everything's got to kind of be rushed through. If you can minimise the 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 building envelope of a of a window or the time horizon, I should say, then then people are making serious money, mm. right? And you we're talking big dollars. So there's a there's a real incentive again it's a it's a key word I think um, mm. to get that through as, as quickly as possible and get those those properties completed and, and settled so uh, you know uh, it, we, we, we'll, we'll wait to see sort of what the what the results of that are I think um, but there's there's a lot of factors at play there that I think that really just that there's a big incentive to expedite that project and and get it through and get it approved with with maybe not as many checks as there ought to be No, I I want to put an open invitation out there to our listeners, actually, because, you know, Chris is very, very vocal on this off the plan and you, and I'm pretty vocal on it as well. It's all about risk. As an individual buyer, you are taking on inordinate amount of risk when you buy off the plan and brand new. And I'm not going to go into the detail of why that is. I mean, obviously, we're touching on some of it here. But the thing is, ultimately, the individual owner is the one that cops it. You know, yep. down the track, the developers yep. walk away, the builders walk away. Um, you know, they can go broke and, and, and do a phoenix job. You yep. know, there's a period of time after which the developer and the, and the builder no longer has any responsibility towards that building yep. and the individual owners do and the owner's corporation does, right? So I want to put out an invitation to developers who in the face of all this opportunity to make money in recent years with the boom and also with support from various levels of government, developers who've made a conscious decision to do it differently rather than just maximising the amount of apartments you can squeeze in your airspace mm. and and flog them, you know, to maximise your profits. And let, let's face it, at the end of the day, you're in business. I get it. I get why you do it, you know, and dumb investors are re- you know willing to line up and buy this stuff so I get it I get why mm. you've done it but I really would love to put the invitation out to someone who hasn't done that a developer who has deliberately chosen to go swim against the tide I'd love to hear from you because we'd really love to interview you yeah yeah 100% I mean I if I was a developer I would see it as a huge opportunity yeah. like if everyone 99% out of the 100 people are building this and that's going to have a limited time frame because at some point in the investor market's going to cool off right yeah. And, the, and it, which has, and so it has, but if you were, you know, zigs and zagged and you went the other way and you said, well, I'm going to build owner occupier, I'm going to build three beds. I'm going to build things that families want. I'm going to build things with bigger green spaces. Yeah. Um, I, and I think a lot of developers will go there now, but I'd love to, you know, see, cause if you're in the day, you're in the industry, you're kind of re- what everyone else is doing, that's affecting you and yeah. your reputation. So now, there's a bit of an irony here because if you go back to episode 51, and I'm not going to tell you listeners what's mm. in there, but go back to episode 51 because we do talk about Opal Tower. Yeah. In oh. light of this. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and we recorded that episode in September. We didn't release it till January 2019, but we recorded it months earlier. Mm. Um, so there's some interesting chat in there around that, so, mm. but I'm not going to give that away. <laughs> I think if you if you do purchase a property off the plan, it's worthwhile sort of getting someone to do a, a, a building compliance inspection for you just to sort of identify defects because there will be a point where the liability of the developer disappears. And often they do disappear. They have different entities that go bankrupt. And they, as you say, they, they rise from the ashes and, and do something else. But yeah, you, you, you really want to be upfront in, in checking for those defects and, and ideally wherever possible, you know, pre-settlement as well. So that's building, a really good point, actually. Yeah. What yeah. is a building compliance inspection? Because that's, I mean, I don't buy off the plan, so I don't even yeah. look into this, but what Yeah, is so that? there's like, there's, there's obviously Australian standards for everything to do with construction. So a compliance person could undertake that inspection to see if everything's done. To, to code to, to but see they're if they still can... looking at reports or are they physically looking at the building they were with, sorry what do you mean so the, the building compliance inspector will yep. just look at the reports and, and the sign-offs on paper or will they actually go to the building they would they would go and, and, and undertake a full inspection of the building yeah mm-hmm. how uh, would you inspect bathrooms for waterproofing yeah I mean that that's where it comes down to to the design documentation and often there's you know what is um, is on the design is is not what is built I mean there's there's a legal tolerance I think it's like five percent so if you buy a you know 100 square meter place legally it could turn out 96 uh, square meters and you still have to go with it so there's definitely there's some limitations with that and that's where it's about doing doing the due diligence of 
uh, on that developer. So if they did something somewhere else, it might even be worth you know flying somewhere else. But chances are, developers are just if they're smaller, they're doing it in the same location. You know, chat to people that have bought there. Like people are always happy to tell you a painful story <laughs> that they think might impact the revenue of the person that slighted them. Right. Mm. So so hunt down those projects and see if there are any nasty stories of, about defects or issues like that. Yeah, I think there's a. I think in development world though, every project's different mm -hmm. and every project's built over a different time frame and has different challenges. Yeah. And you know, what if one project has gone silky smooth yeah. and it's come, come in on budget, it's, you know, had no real major problems with weather or, you know, just through the digging or yeah. the building or council or, you know, there's, they, they might bring this amazing product to market with no defects or there might be very small defects, but in another project, a developer could have an absolute nightmare, yeah. staffing problems. Yeah. And end of the day, when they get to the end, the every day's money, which is what you were talking about with mm. the ship parked at Sydney Harbour, yeah. every day that development's delayed, the more in, they're, they're clocking up big losses and yeah. they're cutting into their own profits. And so what happens is at that also point. Also, you've got a builder, and they may not necessarily have the same builder correct, for each yes. development, but the builder then is in pen, penalty phase as well. So yeah. everyone's in, you know, under pressure to. Yeah. To, uh, well, that's right. And they just need to get finish. it done. And, you know, and you can't blame the developer or the builder. They need to get this done. Mm. They need to get this off. Otherwise there's fines and it's all cut into profit margins every day. It's late. And what ends up happening is the person who deals with that biggest problem is the person buying it. Yeah. Because what happens is the earliest possible that they can issue a notice to complete, they send it and then they put all the pressure on the buyer and say, you've got 21 days to settle this. And if you don't settle, you get penalties. And what happens is it scares the hell out of the buyer mm. and the buyer ends up basically settling with the property that's not completed. Yeah. You know, it's got defects. In the day, you're paying $800,000 for an apartment. Yeah. It should be perfect. You yeah. wouldn't go buy a brand new car yeah. with dents. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't give them the money. Yeah. You, you wouldn't a big buy big discount on your hail damaged car. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't drive it out and say, I've just bought this brand new car. It's got a big dent in the front, the boot's missing a you know, a hole, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm going to sign up to it. But this is $800,000 car you're buying yeah. and um, it's not new. And until it's, and, and if they don't fix it and, you know, you're more likely going to get, you know, there's warranties with cars, you could take it back, but with a building, you just yeah. can't. So Mike, when somebody buys a brand new building and they come to you and say, right, you know, I'm, I'm a brand new investor, I've got a brand new property. Do you do the um, the depreciation schedule or, or do you, does it normally get included as part of the sales kit? It normally doesn't. As part of the sales kit, they, they might get what's called a phase A depreciation estimate, which is normally sort of a one-page marketing tool that says, you know, dear investor or to whom it may concern, if you buy one of the two-bedroom apartments, you'll get roughly eleven to $14,000 in the first year of claim. Or if you buy a three-bedder, it might be thirteen to fifteen, And then it sort of says, you know, due to our familiarity with this building, we can do a reduced fee report. You would need to have a full schedule done to be able to rely on it for tax purposes because it needs to be in your full name your settlement date will be, you know, in a, you know, it'll be a partial financial mm. year in the first year. And then often you might add blinds or something to it as well. So you need mm. to sort of get that tailored, but it doesn't normally come with it. Every now and then you will see a depreciation schedule issued, um, with a development. Sometimes there is a, a developer that has an arrangement with a quantity surveyor and they'll do proper depreciation schedules and then they'll just get the name and the settlement date and they'll churn them out. Mm. Nothing particularly wrong with that. Other times you will see what looks like a builder sort of breaking down, here's what the cost of the unit was and here's your hot water system and your carpet and the depreciation rates might be wrong and then they miss, you know, exhaust fans and hot water systems and the common lifts and Wiring. your entitlement, that sort of stuff, yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I was love the first time I got a depreciation schedule on a property, you know, and they had the wiring and my accountant was so impressed. Yeah. Oh, they've <laughs> even put the wiring in. <laughs> <laughs> Door stops and shower curtains, <laughs> yeah, you know, everything. people love those. So while we're here on just on... Um, tax deductions. I'd just like to get your your views on what's happening with the election. And yeah. uh, I know that for our listeners, we are talking about this a lot, but I think it's, <laughs> it's really important though, is that we are getting more views on it because the more views out there, you can it helps people to understand it better. So what's yeah. your view on it? Yeah. My, my view is that Labor have backed themselves into a corner and they've come up with a policy that I think was a, was a vote grabbing thing. I mean, the, the, certainly there's a the problem with home ownership rates and young people finding it harder to get into, into property, but really they announced a, a policy that was fairly ill thought out. And now we're actually at a point where 
the experts are saying this could be really damaging, not just to the property market, but to the economy at large, should this be enacted. But, you know, they're not wanting to be that typical politician that's going back on a promise. So they're actually sort of stuck with a policy that stinks. Uh, and I think that they probably know that, you know, the, the head of the, the Real Estate Institute is saying it, you know, I spoke to Shane Oliver, he's saying it. Brighter minds than myself are saying that it's a bad idea. Um, Labor have now sort of softened. They've sort of said, well, we might, uh, you know, release it within the first sort of 12 months. That kind of shows that there's a little bit of weakness. They may be starting to understand that it's a, that it's a bad idea. And, and you, you take a property investor out, they're not automatically replaced with a first homeowner. It's just not how it works. Mm, you know, yep. you, you whack an investor, you don't get an uplift of a first homeowner to the exact same amount. And, and, and I, I really think that we're, we're just going to create another problem over time when investors are less active and then there's so much more demand for rentals and then, you know, housing affordability, which we always just kind of think of buying. We don't think about renting in yeah. housing affordability. Housing affordability is going to be another national concern because rental yields have been increasing. And if you look at them, they're, they, they've done nothing for forever, right? Like rental yields have been flat pretty much everywhere for, for 10 years, give or take. Um, and that's because investors have been active and they're providing this housing. The government is out of the public housing business. They own roughly 2% of, of investment housing stock. So investors have a, an important role to play. And I think it's, uh, yeah, I think I made my views fairly clear. <laughs> That's really good. I know. I really, really like that. I mean, there's really, I think your key point there was you do, if you take away investors, it doesn't mean that you're yeah. going to replace them with home buyers. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, when you look at the numbers and a lot of people who defend the policy, they'll say that, well, yeah, we're going to create better home ownership because investors aren't going to be buying. We're not going to be competing with investors. Yep. Mm. And the problem is when you're the houses that first home buyers want, they're not generally competing with investors anyway. Mm, you yeah. know, they're competing with other home buyers yep. and the, and the, where investors are being, have been buying and we've, which we've talked about on this podcast is in areas where other investors are buying. Yep. And so if you want to create housing affordability of new apartments, um, yes, this will do that, but yep. it won't, Great housing affordability where you really want to buy anyway because yeah. investors aren't buying there. So well, actually, what it will create is housing affordability of secondhand new apartments. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And anybody with a right mind wouldn't want to touch one with a barge pole because it's just mm. going to be a saturated market with yeah. very little demand. I got a yeah. little uh, little infographic uh, a year or two ago saying, you know, where do your taxes go? And I thought, oh, this would be interesting. And 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 obviously the the biggest amount is you know on on welfare. And you know we've we've gone past the sort of old Ray Martin story of picking on the dole bludgers and that sort of stuff. But if you look at it, it's it's really sort of the the age that are costing us the most from a welfare point of view with yeah. age pension and that sort of stuff. So it's easy to look at you know negative gearing and net government revenue losses because of negative gearing. But we're, 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 we're actually sort of allowing people to invest in their future yep. that are most likely to get to retirement, get a pension test, and they've got no chance of getting a pension. People don't want it. So if you discourage them from investing, you're just creating a problem down the down the track. I agree. Episode yep. 45, guys. Listen to that. Noel Whitaker, and he talks about that, the true cost of having – aged people or, or the age who are not self-funded. Yeah. So the actual true cost yeah. of having pensioners yeah. in the system. And it's not just obviously the 30 grand a year or whatever it is that they get paid. It's it's actually the, the opportunity cost of that money and, and the investment loss and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and lack of uh, taxable income from self-funded uh, retirees as well, you know, yeah. because the, a lot of them actually pay tax. Yeah. So, um and also paying tax throughout the life of owning that property. You know, mm. once you get to the point where you're actually positive cash flow, then you're going to start paying tax. Yeah. And then if you do end up selling it, you're paying tax. Even with the current capital gains uh, um, concession rates, you're still paying tax. Yeah. So, you know, and that's – it's sort of forgetting all of that. It's really focusing on your 9400 dollars, yeah. you know, deduction that you claim in your first year and sort of focusing on that and that would diminish down to, yeah. I mean, at what point do most people go cash flow neutral? Uh, cash flow neutral, like for, for, on a depreciation point of view, the, the methods sort of cross over after about seven years, which I think is a roughly when people tend to sell properties. It depends where you buy and the yields and that sort of stuff, mm, but it's yeah. only going to be a couple of years yeah. on average, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, 
pe- people sort of um, forget that you know there are people that say, I too, I've got too much tax, I want to buy an investment property. But most people don't buy an investment to lose money. Eventually, mm. over time, they want it to put money in their in their pocket. They don't want to be having to pay to hold yeah. onto it. So it's only negatively geared for a short time. And I think there's a problem with the ATO stats as well. They're they're normally sort of three years behind because you think you know it's tax time, and then you got, you're registered with your accountant. You got till next May to do your tax return. Um, the ATO website is perpetually down, so I, I don't know how much effort they put into producing the stats. But we're looking at negative gearing um, losses at a time where interest rates were a lot higher because mm. we're actually sort of talking at the past. Mm. Yeah. I think in relative terms, the, the last release said that negative gearing losses went up marginally, but you you put you you know you you adjust that for population growth and all those sorts of things. It was pretty flat, and I think it will probably go down. Mm. And with a lot of investors now forced into you know principal and, and interest. We're not going to have those big sort of interest only loans. I, I think that the negative gearing losses are, are blown out of proportion when you consider what's waiting for us at the back end trying to look after people. Yeah, good point. Yeah. But you don't win power with a you know good policy for 30 years. You win <laughs> Yeah. That's, a real, that's, a, that's a real problem years. of leadership in Australia. It always seems to be about, you know, getting elected for the next term. And then some of these sort of grandiose ideas like superannuation is not a really old idea, right? Like John Howard getting rid of guns, right? These things are maybe politically suicide in, in this environment because we've got governments that are winning by slim majorities and everyone mm. wants to sort of cling on to power. We, we lack people that, you know, are, are looking at these. Yeah, like the snowy hydro sort of thing. Oh, that'll be finished 30 years after I've sort of left so you know, mm. how much am I worried about it? I want someone that wants to come in and maybe just go you know what I'm not going to get re-elected because I'm going to sort of implement ideas that I think are for the betterment of the country and then I'll let history decide you know how worthwhile it was. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that journey. <laughs> okay. Every week we hear incredible stories of the dumb things property buyers do. Some things that end up costing them a whole lot of money and or creating a whole lot of stress. Mistakes that can be avoided. Please, Mike, can you give us an example of a property Dumbo? We can all learn what not to do from these stories. Yeah, I feel like Dumbo is a hard one and I feel a little bit sort of mean about it. There was one um, particular property where... um, a lady purchased off the plan and um, she ended up... uh, not having a depreciation schedule for around about eight years. And I, I kind of thought, oh, I don't necessarily want to talk about a particular person. But there, I found another one, another case that was even worse, an, an anonymous one. Someone bought a brand new unit in the Gold Coast. And um, I think it was around about uh, nine or 10 years before they actually engaged us to prepare a depreciation schedule. Now, wow. at that time, you might have been able to back claim four years worth of deductions, but there's still a, a massive year's where they wouldn't have been able to access those depreciation claims. So because they didn't buy through a buyer's agent who could educate them on that or they didn't have a broker that, that understands the importance of depreciation. Or, or accountant. Yeah, an accountant that e- exactly. It. You mm. wonder, you know, like, are they doing their own tax return? If you're mm. a property investor, don't do your own tax yes. return. That's, that's a, a takeaway I'd like to sort of leave today. But the, the end result is they lost around about $70,000 worth of, of tax deductions over that time window where they would have lost that claim. Had wow. they had they have got a depreciation schedule from day one or even within the first three years, that the, the, the difference on their taxable income over that 10 or so years, um, eight to 10 years, was around about 70 grand, which, you know, like it could have been 20 or $30,000 back in their pocket. Wow. And when people sort of say, you know, um, $20,000, $30,000 back in your pocket, like I can, I've spent that in my head already. Yeah. I can already think yeah. where that could go. <laughs> and I think, you know, like... When people win the lotto, they do stupid stuff with it because it doesn't feel real to mm. them. They don't make sensible decisions. And I think leaving money on the table feels the same. It's not real. But if there's money sitting there in, in front of it or if someone transfers it into your bank account, suddenly it has a you know yeah. much more of a value. It becomes a real thing. So I, I think that... That that's my Dumbo of the of the week. Uh, it's just you know it's not getting the right advice. It's not being educated about the property and yeah, just leaving money on the table. And how hard is it to get a depreciation report? Really, it's just a phone call. Yeah. You know, there's don't even have to pick online. up the phone. Send yeah, an, send, send an, an email. Send an email, and for what is it, five six hundred bucks maybe? Yeah, yeah. Something yeah, around that. on average, around about six hundred dollars yeah. is, is so, the marketplace. You know, you're paying six hundred dollars, and you know, do you do a 
if you don't get that type of deduction, yeah. do you do a refund? Yeah, there's a, there's a few companies that have the sort of catchphrase of, you know, double the fee or it's free, that sort of yeah. stuff. Mine, mine like, is really, really clunky. It's like, um, you know, <laughs> we'll give you the option to cancel it without charge if your accountant says it's not worthwhile, right? Because maybe if we find $900 worth of deductions and we've charged, you know, we're going to charge $600, we might say, you know, take that to your account and say, is it worth paying $600 uh, to get this $900 yeah. de deduction? in the first year and they'll say well yeah like because you're not going to sell it for 10 years right so yep. over time you're talking five grand so I've got to find a way to put that into yep. a tighter catchphrase yeah so <laughs> it's one of those guarantees that you know you're never going to have to pay out yep. on because you know 99 percent of people are going to yep. off their fee many times right yeah yeah exactly we, we don't do it unless we know that it's beneficial yeah yep. very uh, good Mike You've set up a page for our listeners, mm. so thank you for that. It's uh, we'll put the link in the show notes, but in case you uh, you know have a really good memory for this, so the the website is uh, mcgqs.com.au forward slash elephant in the room, and he'll provide a free depreciation review of a property you already have or are looking at. Share the data from today that we've discussed. And also offer your listeners a reduced fee. Mm, so yeah. thank you so much. Great that's, marketing idea, that one. That's the best sort of show bag I can <laughs> I can bring. <laughs> we appreciate that. And look, uh, thank you so much for, and obviously we'll put the, the link in the show notes in, in terms of how to get hold of you too, mm -hmm. if people do want to actually engage you to a depreciation schedule or your business. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Mike. We've really enjoyed our chat. There's been some Nice little revelations in there, and certainly I've learnt uh, quite a lot of things. So, thank you for coming along and sharing your wisdom with us. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. Cheers. We want to make you a better elephant rider, and this week's elephant rider training is. Well, when we were talking to Mike, it became really loud and clear the mistakes that investors can make if they don't get good advice before they buy a property. And certainly Mike gave a dumbo over the week around somebody that actually bought a couple of people that bought investment properties off the plan. And it doesn't even matter whether you buy them off the plan or not, to be quite frank, but that didn't get depreciation schedules and how much money they left on the table. So let's talk about the people that you need to get advice from. There's a million people out there with there's a million people out there with opinions when it comes to property. So you've got to be careful, right? Number one, get a good accountant, a good accountant who understands tax and who actually preferably understands property, although that's going to be rare. Um, what you want to do is a good accountant who understands tax so that you get your structure set up you know, correctly in the first place. But also they will make sure you get a depreciation schedule if you're buying an investment property so you don't lose out in that way. The second person you want to get on your team is a good mortgage broker. And once again, you want to get somebody who's very experienced, very investment savvy and can help you not only get the best deal, but actually get the best type of loan for your circumstances. The third person you want to get on board, I really recommend you get a financial planner because if you are buying an investment property, you are supposedly planning for your long-term future. Find a planner who understands property and where it fits in the mix. You need to basically make sure that you do have a long-term plan and that you are preparing adequately for your future, but also insurances and those other things that are really important. The fourth person, you're going to need a lawyer. When you do find a property, you're going to need to get a lawyer who, or a conveyancer who can actually um, advise you on that contract and get advice early on on that. And lastly, I recommend getting a buyer's agent. Once again, though, don't get a buyer's agent who just gives you what you say you want. Get one who actually will advise you, somebody who actually knows what they're talking about and doesn't just go, oh, yeah, I'll get you a property. As I mentioned earlier in this episode, I reckon 5 to 10% maximum available property, available property at any given time is actually good investment. So you want the type of buyer's agent who's actually going to find those types of property for you and bring attention to your own flawed thinking and how that can actually cost you in the long term. I just want to second that little point where Veronica said, find advisors that actually advise you and don't just give you what you want. I think that's the key takeaway here is you actually want someone who's going to be, you know, sitting there playing devil's advocate, looking at all your options and actually saying, look, this is or is not the best thing for you. And he's actually got your best interests at heart. So that's what an advisor is. They're not just a facilitator. Join us for our next episode when we have a special April Fool's edition. Now, this is going to be an annual edition and it is going to coincide with our annual report called 
fools or forecasters. Now, I hope that's got your interest peaked because what we're going to do is look at some of the forecasts and some of the forecasters that have been very vocal in 2018. And now we have the benefit of hindsight. Who should we have listened to? Who's got it right? Who's got it spectacularly wrong? Who are the serial offenders? We're also going to go back 10 years and look at what information was out then and if you acted on it, what position would you be in today? Now, we are learning so much through this research. We're really excited to share it with you. You definitely want to listen to this episode. Don't forget we're on all the social channels. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter. Or you can connect with us on theelephantintheroom.com.au. The links are all there for you. Please connect and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. The Elephant in the Room property podcast is recorded at the Sydney Sound Brewery. This week's podcast was recorded by John Resk, editorial by Gordy Fletcher. Until next week, don't be a dumbo. Now remember, everything we talked about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent who will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances with a statement of advice.